I hope you're ready because today I have four true crime stories lined up for you and believe me, these are some of the most twisted cases I've ever encountered. Prepare yourself for the tale of a cold-blooded killer that absolutely no one suspected. And when you find out all of the details for their unspeakable crimes, you might never look at a farm the same way again. Susan Monica was born Stephen Buchanan in California on July 8, 1948. She served in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War, and after being honorably discharged, she entered the world of engineering. Susan thrived in this field, and by 1991, she had saved enough money to buy a 20-acre parcel of farmland in rural Weimar, Oregon. From there, she wasted no time and immediately got to work building her own house, raising chickens and pigs. After years of working alone, Susan placed an ad on Craigslist in 2013, looking for some extra help on the farm. That's when 56-year-old Robert Haney entered the picture. He was a jack-of-all-trades and agreed to work as a handyman, laborer, and carpenter in exchange for cash payments and a place to stay on the property. However, when months passed without a word, his children decided he had gone a little too far off the grid for comfort. So, on New Year's Day 2014, his worried children drove out to the farm, but were promptly greeted by Susan, who insisted she hadn't seen him since he quit and left four months earlier. Furthermore, she asked if they could take care of his remaining belongings, including his trailer and dog, which seemed very odd to, well, everyone. Jesse said of being on the farm, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Haney's kids sprang into action and filed a missing persons report with the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. However, they found it very difficult to track him down because his income was mainly cash, which meant he left no paper trail behind. Additionally, they discovered that no one had heard from him in months. So naturally, detectives made their way over to Susan's property to inquire about Haney's disappearance, where they were met with a shocking scene. There were cars and different vehicles strewn about the property, with piles of debris all over and strange odors permeating the air. Susan explained to police that Robert had lived and worked on the property for roughly six months before he up and left in early fall. According to Susan, he received a disturbing phone call shortly before his departure from a relative, saying she had been the victim of assault. Susan told deputies that Haney was distraught over the news and began drinking profusely and behaving erratically before suddenly leaving the farm and all of his possessions behind. Susan's story seemed very suspicious to police, but obviously they couldn't go off just a hunch. However, their gut instincts would soon be validated when they tracked Haney's Oregon Trail electronic benefit transfer card. They were startled to find that his card had been used in December after Susan alleged he disappeared at a Walmart just 25 minutes from her property. Adding fuel to the fire, detectives watched the security camera footage and saw Susan clear as day using Haney's EBT card. Officers executed a search warrant on the farm, but it was no easy job as they had to sift through massive heaps of industrial waste, rotten food, and garbage. But the worst was yet to come. As they made their way through the filth, investigators saw something absolutely chilling sticking out from a catchment pond. It was a human leg. It appeared to have been cut mid-femur, down to the toes. Immediately, Susan was taken downtown for questioning, and she offered a bizarre story to detectives. She claimed to have stumbled upon a feeding frenzy in the pig pen last fall, and Haney was in the middle, so rather than call the police, Susan grabbed a gun and shot him to put him out of his misery before leaving his body there for a few more days. Then she put his remains in various garbage bags and left them in the barn, saying an animal must have found them and dragged the leg down to the pond. Susan told investigators that she didn't immediately tell them the truth because she was scared of what might happen to her pigs. So, it's not a pretty story, but it's certainly plausible. That is, until Susan kept talking. Now, here's where things really take a twisted turn, because when asked one last time what detectives might find on her property during the search, Susan finally caved and admitted they might find something else. She requested a pencil and paper to sketch a map of her property, and to the absolute horror of every investigator, 
She drew a large X right in the middle. Susan said, right there. That's where you're going to find Steve. Wait, what? Yes, Susan just outright confessed to concealing the body of another handyman named Stefan Delicino. She told them he had worked on her farm a year before Haney and blamed him for stealing two of her guns in the summer of 2012. According to Susan, when she confronted him about the theft, they started wrestling and one of the guns went off, shooting Delicino in the head. However, the blast didn't kill him, and he began chasing Susan to the barn where she raised a rifle and shot him once more in the head. So what did she do next, you ask? Morbidly, she fed his body to her pigs and then buried whatever was left behind where she had marked the X. As if this story couldn't get any more outlandish, police asked Susan once again during the interview if there was anything else she forgot to mention. Her response sent a chill down their spines. She confessed to burying 17 more bodies on the farm. As I'm sure you saw coming, Susan Monica was arrested on January 14, 2014 and booked on two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of abuse of a corpse, and one count of identity theft. Over the next few weeks, investigators continued to comb through the mess at Susan's farm, and they dug around 100 holes until they located the remains of Haney and Delicino. Interestingly, they were unable to find any other bodies on her property. However, the lead investigator maintains that more people are out there as they did locate a massive pile of shoes during the search. Additionally, several witnesses testified to seeing her feed animals to her pigs, with many saying she even joked about feeding humans to them as well. Pleading not guilty on all counts, Susan took many liberties representing herself during her trial and even cross-examined the case's lead investigator, Eric Henderson. She would regularly interrupt the trial proceedings and was removed from the courtroom several times. The prosecution alleged that her sequence of events was incredibly skewed and claimed that the evidence pointed to Susan having intentionally shot both men before feeding them to her pigs. During the second week of the trial, an Oregon State Police anthropologist testified that Haney's legs were removed with an axe and that his thigh bones could have been gnawed on by animals. However, he couldn't state with certainty whether or not Haney was deceased before the dismemberment of his legs, but he did declare that Delicino had been shot three or four times in the head. Strangely, a cellmate of Susan's also testified that she had signed a birthday card in jail from the sweetest murderer in Jackson County. Her attorneys tried to say it was just a sick sense of humor, but the court thought otherwise. On the very last day of her trial, April 21, 2015, and while Circuit Judge Tim Barnack addressed the jury prior to deliberations, Susan interrupted court one more time, raising her hand and saying, I'd like to demonstrate how I shot him for 10 seconds. At first, she was simply ignored, but then she started lifting her hands in a crazed demonstration, and the judge ordered sheriff's deputies to take her away until the verdict was read. Finally, after deliberating for just one hour, a jury found Susan Monica guilty on all counts. She was thereby sentenced to a minimum of 50 years at Coffee Creek Correctional Facility with no opportunity for parole. The families of Robert Haney and Stefan Delicino were at last given the closure they so desperately craved. I'll leave you with a quote from Judge Tim Barnack, who oversaw the trial. You shot two people and fed them to your pigs. I don't know how else I can put it, you valued pigs more than you value people. It may sound harsh, but you are a cold-blooded killer. I couldn't have said it better myself. Alexandria Ali Madison Costiel was born on September 11, 1997 in St. Louis, Missouri to Cindy and Keith Costiel. In July 2019, Ali was gearing up for her senior year at the University of Mississippi and she recruited her parents' help in setting up her new off-campus apartment. While the 21-year-old couldn't wait to graduate in the spring of 2020 with a marketing degree, she was also excited to be teaching yoga and Pilates classes throughout the year. So, Ali said a heartfelt goodbye to her parents after several days together. But what they didn't know was that it would be the last time they would ever see their beloved daughter alive again. 
In just three short days, the once bright and bubbly young woman would be found dead. At around 1.15 in the afternoon on Friday, July 19, 2019, Allie wrapped up an exam for her Introduction to Retail summer school course. It's unclear what she did next, but we know for sure that at around midnight, she was caught on surveillance video footage leaving Funky's Pizza and Daiquiri Bar, located in the heart of the Oxford Square, wearing a blue dress and a white jacket. She could be seen walking across the street to wait at the corner outside the famous Rooster's Blues house. After several minutes of Allie standing outside, appearing to be on her phone, a gray Uber minivan pulls up and she gets in. Her roommate, Lauren Riddick, reported seeing her friend back home at around midnight, but she couldn't verify when she left the apartment again. Some sources claim she was picked up on surveillance footage at a convenience store near Harmontown early Saturday morning with a mysterious man. In any case, a discovery later that morning would shake the college town right to its bones. Allie's body was discovered just before 10.30 at a campsite on Sardis Lake by a Lafayette County Sheriff's Department deputy patrolling the Buford Ridge area of Harmontown, approximately 30 miles from the university. The Lafayette County Sheriff's Department confirmed her shocking death on Sunday afternoon, and it was immediately labeled as a homicide. Well, it didn't take long for the name Brandon Thiesfield to emerge. Originally from Fort Worth, Brandon was a former Ole Miss student who had developed an on-again, off-again relationship with Allie a few years earlier. According to close friends, their relationship was complicated, to say the very least. And it only became more unstable when Allie sent Brandon images of an inconclusive home pregnancy test in April 2019. He responded to her with a text saying a baby would ruin his life, and his computer revealed countless searches for abortion services and pills. Over the next three months, communication between the pair grew more strained as Allie repeatedly requested to meet up and discuss whether she was pregnant or not. Sadly, however, things took a turn for the worse on July 12, 2019, when Brandon reportedly sent Allie an ominous message telling her there was no need to meet. Unbeknownst to everyone, he had traveled back home to Texas and retrieved his father's 40 caliber Glock 22. Two days later, he posted a photo of the pistol to social media with the caption, finally taking my baby back to Oxford. Oh, and that's not all. It turns out this guy was pretty busy on his computer the next few days as well. According to the state's evidence, he looked up tactical face masks how to listen to police scanners, and even how serial killer Ted Bundy lured victims. You know, totally normal stuff. Anyways, Brandon made his way back to Oxford on July 16, 2019, and texted Allie the next day to let her know that he was finally ready to meet in person. Then, just after 9 that night, he messaged back asking her to let him know when she was home. Brandon picked Allie up from her apartment and surveillance captured his truck headed towards Sardis Lake at around 1.15 in the morning. Approximately one hour later, a resident of South Sardis Lake reported hearing gunshots, and by 2.50 in the morning, GPS data showed Brandon's cell phone moving back towards Oxford. As word of Allie and Brandon's tumultuous relationship began to surface, law enforcement officers grew eager to speak with him. However, after failing to appear at the station twice, the police had no choice but to bring him in the hard way. On the morning of July 22, 2019, Brandon was apprehended at a gas station in South Memphis with the murder weapon still in his truck. He was booked into the Lafayette County Detention Center that afternoon, ironically, just as Allie's body was sent to the state crime lab in Pearl for an autopsy. Meanwhile, as the investigation into Brandon's Oxford apartment commenced, Police uncovered a two-page handwritten letter saying, Dear Mom and Dad, I am not a good person. It is not your fault. Something in me just doesn't work. I've always had terrible thoughts. I've always had these demons. I know I'm going to get caught. Pretty damning, if you ask me. Furthermore, ballistics tests verified that the shell casings and bullets found in and around Allie's body matched the gun found in Brandon's possession. He was officially charged with her murder on July 23, 2019. 
Brandon's father quickly hired attorneys who declared their client intended to enter a not guilty plea. As the trial got underway, an astonishing piece of evidence came to light that made this case even more senseless and painful for those who loved Allie. While it didn't come as a surprise to anyone that the autopsy report listed her cause of death as multiple gunshot wounds, it was a complete shock to learn that she was not, in fact, pregnant. During Allie's autopsy, the medical examiner found no evidence to support that she had been expecting at the time of the heinous crime. And although Brandon has never fully admitted his motive for killing Allie, many suspect it was due to the possible pregnancy, and it was undeniably the thread holding this entire case together. So, therefore, it's devastatingly possible that Allie was murdered over something that wasn't even true. After it came out that Brandon was facing a capital murder charge, he publicly switched his plea to guilty of murder in the first degree. This change was very strategic, given it took the death penalty and a life in prison without the possibility of parole off the table. Consequently, Brandon Thiesfield was sentenced to life in jail and will be eligible for a conditional release when he turns 65. In her heartbreaking obituary, people were encouraged to honor the Ole Miss student by taking time to fully appreciate the world's natural beauty, something Allie did every day of her short life. All right, now let's move on to the next case and be careful not to jump to conclusions here because sometimes the killer isn't who you first suspect. The date is Monday, June 17, 2019, and 23-year-old Mackenzie Lewick has just returned to Salt Lake City after attending her grandmother's funeral in her hometown of El Segundo, California. Her flight landed at 1.35 in the morning. Shortly after, Mackenzie got into a lift outside the airport, and from there, she seemingly vanished into thin air. On Thursday, June 20, 2019, Mackenzie's father contacted the Salt Lake City Police Department, frantically explaining that he hadn't heard from his daughter since Sunday night. Word spread fast, and by the next day, friends and family were handing out flyers with the missing girl's face on them all around Salt Lake City. A little background. Mackenzie Speth Lewick grew up in the Los Angeles suburb as the second of Diana and Gregory Lewick's four children and the couple's only daughter. She was known for her infectious smile and outgoing personality. Seeking some independence, Mackenzie enrolled at the University of Utah, majoring in kinesiology and pre-nursing. So, Mackenzie had just disappeared after getting into a lift, and naturally, investigators wanted to speak with the driver right away. And just like everyone else, they had their suspicions. Nevertheless, police managed to track down the man behind the wheel, Michael Canada, who fully cooperated and admitted to dropping the young woman off at Hatch Park in North Salt Lake, just 20 minutes away from the university. He claimed it was a pretty typical ride, but as the two made small talk, he said Mackenzie mentioned how strange it was to be dropped off in the middle of a park so late at night. Still, she said a friend would be picking her up. Chillingly, he told investigators that he had even put Mackenzie's bag into the trunk of the Subaru that pulled up around 3 in the morning, but he didn't get close enough to see the driver. Michael Canada was officially cleared by police in relation to Mackenzie's disappearance. Although a setback in the investigation, this discovery meant that the person everyone immediately suspected wasn't actually the last person to see her alive. Police grew more desperate for answers, and on June 24, 2019, they made a public plea for any information regarding her whereabouts. They even released the last known footage of Mackenzie from the airport, but no clues came until they took a closer look at her phone. Mackenzie, like many other young women, was active on several dating platforms, including Tinder, Seeking Arrangement, and Call Her Daddy. As police dug deeper into her dating app history, the name Ayula Ajayi stood out as someone Mackenzie had been chatting with on the night she vanished. In addition to a slew of incriminating images and messages from that night, cell phone data also placed them both in Hatch Park at 3 in the morning on June 17, 2019. Officers questioned him at his home, but with no hard evidence to go on, they had no choice but to leave empty-handed. One week after Mackenzie went missing, Ayula voluntarily walked into the Salt Lake City Police Department to offer an alibi. 
explaining to police that he was with his baby mama and had never met Mackenzie in person. He appeared cooperative during his conversation with officers and said he came down because I knew I could help. That might have worked out just swell if it wasn't for the digital footprints he left behind, which resulted in a search warrant being issued two days later. On Wednesday, June 26, 2019, investigators searched his home and what they found sent a ripple of fear through the community. After digging holes in the backyard where neighbors reported witnessing a Eula burning something with a horrible smell, police could be seen leaving the residence with multiple bags and boxes of evidence. Testing would later confirm that some of the items included human remains and Mackenzie's personal belongings. They also searched for a mattress and box spring Ayula had listed for free on the website Let Go just a few days earlier. As if this case couldn't get any creepier, contractor Brian Wolf was watching the news when he realized he knew the home being searched. He explained to police that the man living there had asked him to build a weird room three months earlier, but he declined after hearing the unsettling details of his request. Ayula had asked the contractor to customize a hollowed-out area under the front porch into a secret soundproof room with large hooks anchored above head height into the concrete wall. One day after the extensive search, a SWAT team arrested Ayula at gunpoint. The 31-year-old tech support worker was booked into the Salt Lake County Jail for investigation of aggravated murder, aggravated kidnapping, desecration of a human body, and obstruction of justice. The investigation narrowed in on Logan Canyon, an isolated location nearly 100 miles north. Mackenzie's charred remains were recovered on July 3rd, 2019, in a shallow grave in the canyon. According to his lawyer, Ayula had planned to murder Mackenzie before ever meeting her in person and had even switched off his home security cameras in advance. After picking her up at the park, Ayula drove Mackenzie to his home forcibly tied her hands behind her back and strangled her with a belt until she stopped moving. However, an autopsy determined her cause of death to be from blunt force trauma to the left side of her head. Strangely, she was also found to be missing part of her scalp and had a five centimeter hole in her skull. Ayula confessed to burning her remains the next day before burying her body and some belongings in his backyard. After police paid him a visit, he dug up the remains and took them to Logan Canyon. Ayula gave a brief apology to the Lewick family in court, saying, I'm sorry for what I did, and I deserve what I get, deserve what I'm going to get. I know this won't bring her back. The motive behind Mackenzie's death remains unknown, but prosecutors alleged he simply wanted to know what it felt like to take someone's life. Either way, Ayula pleaded guilty to murdering Mackenzie and is now serving life in prison. Amet St. Guillen was born in Boston, Massachusetts on March 2, 1981, to Samundo Guillen and Marine St. Hilaire. Sadly, her father passed away when she was just nine years old, but Amet continued his legacy by pursuing a master's degree in criminal justice at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. The beautiful and bright student was on track to graduate in May 2006 and was even ranked in the top 5% of her class. But sadly, Amet's life would be cut short just months before that could happen. With her 25th birthday rapidly approaching, Amet took a trip to Florida with friends and family, returning to New York on Friday, February 24, 2006. Amet decided to go out bar hopping in the Bowery area of New York City with her best friend, Claire Higgins. The girls were out until around 3.30 in the morning, when Claire decided to call it a night. She begged her friend to catch a cab home with her, but Amet stubbornly insisted on staying out a little bit longer. The two had a heated discussion before Claire, realizing she couldn't force Amet to do anything, got into the cab and drove away. Concerned about her safety, Claire called roughly 30 minutes later to check in, and much to her relief, Amet said that she had moved to a different bar but would be heading home soon. Tragically, just 17 hours later, police received an anonymous phone call at around 8.30 on Saturday evening, informing them of a dead woman's body found on the side of a remote street in Brooklyn. When authorities arrived on the scene, they were met with something more gruesome 
than they could have ever imagined. An unidentified young woman was found naked and wrapped in a comforter with her hands and feet tied, her head bound with clear packing tape, and a sock shoved down her throat. There was no identification on or near the body, and the presence of broken and bloodied fingernails indicated that she had desperately fought for her life. Investigators were immediately struck by the level of violence inflicted, and oddly, they also discovered that someone had intentionally hacked off portions of her hair. An autopsy later revealed the unimaginable pain and torture she had endured in her final moments, concluding that she had been brutally beaten and assaulted before succumbing to asphyxiation. Additionally, they noticed strange red fibers attached to the adhesive tape, but there was still very little to go on at that point. The special victim squad of the New York Police Department got right to work, seeking to identify the unknown woman or the anonymous male caller. After several hours with no contact, Amet's family began to grow worried. They filed a missing persons report with police the next day, Sunday, and Amet's sister, Alejandra, drove from Boston to New York to check out her Upper West Side apartment. While she was there, Alejandra got in touch with the police, who, after hearing of Amet's recent trip to Florida, requested she come down to the station. You see, the body in the morgue had very distinctive tan lines, and when Alejandra arrived, she was, unfortunately, able to positively identify the woman as her sister. Simultaneously, Claire had been out canvassing the city, looking for any sign of Amet and sharing her photo with anyone who would listen. Finally, she stopped at a bar called The Falls on Lafayette Street to ask if anybody there had seen her when Alejandra called to deliver the devastating news. Tears streaming down her face, Claire turned to the bar's manager, Danny Dorian, and said, My friend was missing, but they found her body. The manager responded without any emotion, saying, New York can be a tough town. Due to the incredibly violent nature of the crime, Detectives suspected the motive was personal and began looking into a Met's love life. They contacted her ex-boyfriend and for a brief period, police thought they had their guy, but he was ruled out due to an airtight alibi. Strangely, just two weeks before the attack on a Met, a woman had been picked up in a cab and was violently assaulted before being thrown out into the street. Now, of course, New York is a big city but the attack took place just a few blocks from where Emmett's lifeless body had been dumped, so it seemed far from coincidental. As a result, newspapers went to town with headlines depicting a crazed cabbie on the loose. Then, suddenly, following a heartfelt plea from Emmett's mother on the local news, the cab driver responsible for assaulting the other woman turned himself in to police. Still, like the ex-boyfriend, he too had a rock-solid alibi for the night of February 24, 2006. So, their hunt for a vicious killer continued. Detectives scoured the area surrounding Amet's last known whereabouts, going into every bar and trying to gather any clues. But their big break didn't come until her credit card records came back. The last charge on Amet's card was at the Falls. Yes, you heard me right. That's the same bar Claire had been at when she got the heartbreaking call from Alejandra. Oh, and remember the bar's not-so-nice manager, Danny Dorian? Well, it turns out police claimed he hadn't been entirely truthful when they first came to ask questions. According to investigators, Dorian was very evasive during their first visit and asserted that he had never seen a Matt before. However, with new evidence proving she was last seen alive at the falls, he came clean. Dorian told police that Emmett had been halfway through her second drink at closing time and got angry when asked to leave, so the bouncer, Daryl Littlejohn, escorted her from the premises. The manager reported hearing the two arguing outside the bar for a short period, and then nothing. All right, now get ready for this. Dorian's twisted reason for not telling detectives that Emmett was in his bar that night had nothing to do with Emmett but another high-profile murder. That's because his family owned Dorian's red hand on the Upper East Side, the spot where convicted killer Robert Chambers, aka the Preppy Killer, met 18-year-old Jennifer Levin in 1986 before strangling her to death in Central Park. According to Dorian, he remembered all too well how his family was treated during that time and couldn't bear the idea of more negative publicity. 
the fact that yet another attractive young woman found herself at a Dorian-owned establishment and wound up dead the very same night certainly raised some eyebrows, but police had to speak with the bouncer to get the whole story. Authorities first looked into Little John's background and found some disturbing information, including that he had spent more than 12 years in prison for drug possession and armed robbery charges. Additionally, he was out on parole at the time and had been violating the curfew of his agreement by working at the bar. After hours of being interviewed, Little John finally started talking and admitted to accompanying Emmett out of the bar, but insisted they both went their separate ways. Fortunately, police were able to hold him on the parole violation while they searched for more evidence, and it didn't take long to uncover some seriously incriminating details. Detectives weren't surprised by the lack of eyewitnesses, given it was around four in the morning, but in the city that never sleeps, the homeless population is always watching. So they spoke with a homeless man named Miguel Angel Cruz, who claimed to have seen Little John walking a very intoxicated Ahmed down the street towards a dark van. He heard him say, don't worry, I'll take you home, before putting her in the front seat and driving away. At his home, authorities found the same van described by Cruz in Little John's driveway, and that was just the tip of the iceberg. Inside his basement apartment, a red carpet and several fur coats carried fibers matching those found at the crime scene. Cell phone tower records provided additional evidence that the bouncer was moving from his home to a location near where the body was found. Then, just as things were really heating up, police made a bombshell announcement. The blood found on the zip ties around Matt's wrists was a match to Daryl Littlejohn. He was subsequently charged with one count of first-degree murder, and two counts of second-degree murder for her death. Naturally, photos of Little John and his vehicle were plastered all over the news, and right away, two women came forward to share their own harrowing stories. They both testified that he had posed as a police officer in Queens and abducted them in the same black van, confirming the detective's suspicions that Little John was an incredibly dangerous individual with a history of assault. After being charged with the two attacks in Queens, Prosecutors used this evidence at his trial for the murder of Amet St. Guillen. Opening arguments began on May 11, 2009, with the defense claiming Little John was being framed to protect Danny Dorian. However, after a series of chilling testimonies and condemning evidence, the prosecution rested their case on May 28, 2009. It took the jury less than seven hours to reach a verdict, guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life without parole and will serve it consecutively alongside his previous 25-year-to-life term for kidnapping the Queen's woman. It's beyond devastating to think that someone who wanted nothing more than to advocate for others became the victim of such a heinous crime. <laughs>